Good morning. I'm Gabriele Mattino, a research associate at Save Venice. I would like to thank you all for joining us today, especially the members of Save Venice. I am particularly thrilled to stream live from the Rosen Library and Study Center in Venice, together with Dr. Giorgio Tagliaferro. Uh, Dr. Giorgio Tagliaferro is Associate Professor at the University of Warwick, and I must confess that we've been known each other for nearly 20 years. Uh, legend has it that when I was a young undergraduate at the Kafoskari University, uh, the hardest exam that I had to take was indeed with Giorgio Tagliaferro. Now, apart from these terrifying memories, uh, Giorgio Tagliaferro earned his PhD from the University of Kafoskari. He did teach in a number of uh, institutions and is now, as I said before, at the University of Warwick. Um, he was the recipient of a number of very uh, prestigious fellowships, including the Getty Research Institute Residential Fellowship, the British Academy Small Grant, and the Leverhulme Research Fellowship. Um, Giorgio Tagliaferro's work is mostly known because of his uh, seminal book on Titian's workshop. Uh, titled The Bottega di Tiziano, uh, the book actually revolutionized the, uh, the field. But of course, Tagliaferro worked on many other topics, including, of course, Tisha, uh, Titian, but also Veronese and Tintoretto. And more recently, co-edited with Tom Nichols and Mary Louise Lillywhite, uh, a book titled Tintoretto, Identity, Practice and Meaning, which is a conference proceeding from a very interesting conference that was held in Oxford a few years ago. Uh, Today's talk uh, will focus on the Room of the Four Doors in the Ducal Palace. As you know, that is one of our major current projects, uh, but it also was and is one of the most important rooms within the uh, Ducal Palace. Um, Giorgio Tagliaferro has been working on that topic for a long time. It was indeed Part of uh, his PhD dissertation, uh, he worked on narrative cycles within the Ducal Palace and is now the subject of his current uh, book project on, again, narrative cycles within some of the rooms of the Ducal Palace. So I think that Giorgio is indeed the best fit for this lecture. Uh, before I leave the floor to Giorgio, I will remind you that for anyone who has questions, please uh, type them in the Q&A section and they will be addressed by the end of this uh, presentation. So without further ado, I now leave the floor to Giorgio Tagliaferro. Well, thank you so much, Gabriele, for this um, very, very generous introduction, reminding me of how harsh we were years ago, myself and other people <laughs> when examining students. Um, thanks for, to Save Venice organization for inviting me to give this talk on a topic that I really care about. And as Gabriella mentioned, I've been working on the Dodgers Palace for a, and its decoration for a while now and and um I, I thought it would be a good idea to share this with um uh with people who are not in the field but maybe interested in knowing more about this um decoration so without further ado i will for the next about 40 minutes i'll try to highlight the um historical and artistic importance of this decoration um, and and try to em emphasize especially why it matters so much to preserve this uh, unique uh, ensemble of uh, sculptures and paintings th that are in this room. Um, just to begin by locating what we're talking about and where this is, I suppose these images are quite popular and iconic of Venice with its Doge's Palace circled in these pictures. Um, it's the it's a landmark that for centuries has uh, made of the, the skyline of Venice a unique wonder of the world. Uh, it's been like that for centuries, and even in for instance in this illustration from a travelogue, uh, you can see how the Doge's Palace was basically the one of the, the most important buildings, and alongside the Basilica of Saint Mark. Uh, which is just next to it, the center 
the visual center of the city. And actually, this is where uh, the uh, the people who traveled to Venice basically landed when they docked their boats uh, in the center of the city. Uh, whereas for now, now we have a completely different perception of the city usually entering from uh, an, other places, not directly from, uh, say, Mark Square. But this is the kind of view that was intended to impress visitors. And the Doge's Palace plays a prominent role along with the, also with the bell tower that you see and other buildings. Uh, now, the, um, the Doge's Palace has this uh, U-shape um, given the, to the fact that it was basically it's three different buildings that were unite, unified and united into one single building over the centuries. And the uh, 16th century is when basically this architectural shape um, becomes kind of permanent. But it's also when the majority of the decoration that you see now in the Doge's Palace, the most monumental rooms in the Doge's Palace, Palazzo Ducale, uh, take definite, definite shape. And um, it also, this includes our room, which is at the second floor. Uh, in this, the right wing in the picture, uh, the, the 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 wing of the palace that uh, um, um, is it's just on along the canal uh, that is crossed by the famous bridge of size that you see in the bottom right uh, here in the in the picture. So when you enter the Rujas Palace right now from uh, the um, waterfront, you enter the courtyard and you find the room just up there where on the right and second floor. And this is just to locate. Um, it's a room that has an important function as I will now just show through this map, uh, the ground plan of the second floor. Uh, it's called the uh, the, the room of the four doors, precisely because it has four doors, as you can see here, um, leading to four different spaces. And um, these are basically the most, some of the most important um, state rooms in the palace. Uh, it's a room, therefore, that regulated the food traffic by giving access to uh, state rooms where the executive power uh, took place basically uh, the Senate. The name itself tells you of the importance. It's basically the the most prominent body that decided of the Venetian politics, but also the Collegio with its ante room. Uh, it's where the um, a, a more used number of uh, Venetian uh, noblemen, um, along with the Doge, uh, presided uh, important. Uh, gatherings and meetings, especially uh, meeting with the subject, the delegates of the subject cities and also of foreign countries. Um, there it was a, there is an atrium actually, which is where that uh, staircase that you see uh, next to it is um, uh, land, which is the uh, where still now visitors land before entering the uh, room uh, of the four doors. And then finally, on the other end, there is the uh, chancery and council of 10 rooms. Um, we have to say that the, the, the Palazzo Ducale was a, a multifunctional building, multitask. It was where the Doge lived um, and the Doge uh, remained in office until he died. So when he was elected and basically he and his family moved permanently to the Doge's palace. But it was also the administrative and political center of the uh, of the uh, of Venice, where the government to, uh, had, had it, its seat, and also it housed law courts, prisons, and warehouses. So uh, this room became a central room in terms of how the the administrative life in the palace was administered. So it becomes a hinge for a new layout of the state rooms in the uh, 16th century. Now this is the room. Uh, you see two pairs of doors. This is this picture is taken from the um, St. Mark Square. Uh, so in front of you, there is the, the uh, um, wall facing the canal that I mentioned before. Um, so it's not bad to have some something like a, a very functional and pragmatic place, space like this one being decorated in such a lavish place. So even if this was just basically a some sort of um, um, 
a place for switching, as we would say today, talking of trains, um, it, it was decorated in a very grandiose and stately way, very imposing. It's a decoration that is made of stuccos and frescoes. It's part of a series of decorative campaigns that transformed the Doge's Palace into the building we all know now, which is uh, made of, uh, it's a system of interlinked visual programs celebrating Venice as a republic, but also its body politic and the ruling class. When we say the ruling class, we mean the aristocracy. Um, Venice was a republic, there was no king. The Doge was elected, uh, but had basically no personal power and he had to just be uh, the head of a body, collective body formed by uh, all the noblemen. This is a key point about for what we're talking about, as the title of this talk mentions, liberty and nobility are going to be the main themes that I discuss in relation to this decoration. Um, so clearly, because this is a place where a lot of people just pass through both visitors and people who work there. Um, the decoration was aimed at impressing a volume of people in transit through this room to the next ones. And therefore, um, you know, it was seen by a lot of people. But I have to say that probably today this doesn't really stand out for some reasons, which I also tried to uh, explain uh, as the most prominent of the rooms. and. Besides that, it's an extremely important room for what it, uh, the message it conveys and um, the, also the artistic value that it carries. So uh, a few pictures of the room. This is uh, taken from the opposite end to the right. And then uh, this is taken uh, from uh, the previous the, uh, viewpoint as before with the other two doors. Uh, these four doors that you see here were decorated um, with um, uh, three, four, sorry, sculptural groups, uh, three statues each, so 12 sculptures in the 1580s. But that is some sort of later addition to the main decoration of the room, which is which consists of the, and the most impressive, and I have this a uh, detail for of the of the four doors with the statues, um, so the the main the main bulk of this decoration is the ceiling, which is what actually needs uh, conservation at present because of, of its really poor state of conservation. Um, this was uh, decorated with stuccos by a known Venetian artist, an artist from Lombardy, uh, who is known with the surname, the nickname Bombarda, and then frescoes by a very famous artist, Jacopo Tintoretto, which is one of the major uh, artists of 16th century Venice and more generally of uh, European Renaissance art. Now, I'll try to uh, highlight in the first instance the historical importance of this decoration, what this decoration is about. And then at the second, uh, later, uh, in the second part of, the, of this talk, I will go into more details about especially the frescoes, which carry the, the most important part of this uh, message. Um, I titled this, I made reference to visual propaganda. Um, actually, this is visual propaganda because this shows the power of images to convey complex messages in a persuasive and immediate way and to give concrete shape to abstract concepts or beliefs and conjure up multiple meanings at the same time, something words can rarely do with the same effectiveness. There is a particular, a particular emphasis uh, here and in the other decorations within the Doge's Palace that were made at the end of the 16th century on continuity with the past. The Doge's Palace was perceived by the Venetians as the living memory of the past. And this is a key aspect of the rhetorical, rhetorical construction of Venice, which was promoted by the ruling class. Venice as an extraordinary place and the perfect government and the unbroken change with the illustrious ancestors who miraculously founded the city on the waters and established its civic institutions is a key aspect of this propaganda. So uh, what is really important and matters to us still now, I think, is that these 
decorations reflect the construction of civic and communal identity that characterized Venice over the centuries. And I think this is particularly important nowadays when the risk of a massive globalized tourism puts at risk the identity of this city. One peculiar thing about this place, as you can see from these images, uh, and I'll better explain uh, later, um, you don't see any face of a ruler. You see figures that are mostly either uh, personifications of abstract concepts or virtues or Venice itself, which is the lady who is taken by that bearded man on the central fresco in this image. Well, what you don't find usually in this uh, decoration, in these decorations, is the representation of a single ruler. Whereas, where you, if you go to London to see Rubens's decoration of the White, of Whitehall Palace, you will find a representation of James the uh, First, who is uh, the first king who united the crowns of Scotland and England, which was celebrated retrospectively by his son, Charles the First, the king who was beheaded. Now, as Charles's own experience demonstrates, well, kings are fleeting and mortal. And um, so when, you, when the monarchy is celebrated, it is celebrated through the image of the king. Uh, you, you see here the apotheosis of James I, and here at the center, another representation of uh, James I with the virtues of his government. Well, interestingly enough, Rubens was inspired by Veronese's own allegory of Venice, which is in another room of the Doge's Palace, the Great Council Hall room, sorry, the Great Council Hall, uh, where you can see, instead of a king, a um, queen. And that queen has no individualized identity. It's an immortal representation of Venice. It's a representation of Venice that embodies an idea of, per of perfection, an idea of perfection that goes beyond the individuality of a single king. So that is the concept of permanency and continuity with the past that I mentioned before. And if you go to Florence instead and enter the big Salone di Cinquecento, in, which is the largest room in the palace that oh, was remade by the Duke, the first Duke of Flor the first Grand Duke of Florence, Cosimo de Medici, you will find at the center of the room a, a representation of himself as a Roman emperor. So if you compare it with Veronese's image, you will see that there are similarities, but the difference is that you don't have a portrait of a king. You have a sort of um, unindividualized image of a queen. So for the Venetians, this was much more effective and permanent, as I said before, than the fleeting identity of a king. So I highlighted what I think is the historical importance of the of the uh, of the of the room of the decoration uh, and the background. Now I'll try to show the artistic importance, starting from this unique layout, uh, uh, which integrates stuccos and frescoes, which is non-Venetian in uh, principle. Um, actually, uh, to, be, to begin with, the what, what is represented? What are these? You, you can see figures uh, like these uh, life-size figures. These are Olympian deities, gods and goddesses but also personifications of virtues. And they are inspired, of course, uh, by the Roman tradition, classical tradition. But you also find other uh, figures, for instance, the lunette uh, uh, to the left here, the center at the left, to the left, you see a winged lion Saint Mark, which is of course, a symbol of the Republic. And to the right, you see a coat of arms. Well, that coat of arms is that of the reigning, the then reigning doge, Alvise Mocenigo. We are in the 1570s. We're just after a fire that burned down the previous decoration, which was bright and new, actually. But in 1574, it was completely destroyed. So this is made anew and in a way that is very, very uh, um, remarkable because it doesn't match any Venetian precedent, as I will show shortly. Um, so you have deities, um, you have the wing lion, you have the coat of arms uh, of the doge. Uh, you can see the wing lions are up two actually with the book, with a famous book with the uh, open in a peaceful, with a peaceful message relating to the uh, evangelist Saint Mark, uh, whose attribute is the wing lion. That's why this is the 
it becomes the the symbol of the the emblem or the logo, as we would say today, of the Republic of Venice, which was the Republic called the Republic of Saint Mark. And you also see a representation, a personification of a figure, which is 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 a, is a female figure. I have a better detail in the next slide, but. Uh, you can see she's sitting on two lions and she has a crown. She would also uh, um, bear a, a, a sword and scales, but these have gone lost. Um, this is an iconography which is established in Venice and it's a representation of Venice as a personification. So um, clearly this idea of the Olympian gods and Venice means that Venice is projected onto a celestial realm. It's the perfection of her rule, which is divine. And here, of course, the Olympian gods are just used as metaphors of dignity, of a higher dignity. But uh, uh, this is also inflected in a Christian way. And to begin with, along with her, there are personifications of virtues which mattered both in, the cl in classical and Christian terms, like justice on top left, or abundance top right, or prudence uh, bottom left. But... There are also frescoes, very damaged, of prophets and sibyls. These are those who foretell God, uh, the, the word of God, the arrival of Christ. So they, uh, they, what they convey is, is the idea of God's favor over Venice. Venice is part of the divine plan of salvation. And this is something I will say more about because that relates also to the central fresco. Now, in terms of design, and this is the very interesting thing, um, the, as I said before, this is very unseen in Venice. Uh, this is something that um, uh, combines architectural elements and figurative decoration uh, in a sort of uh, continual way, continuity, which is given by both the material, stucco and gilding, especially in the frames and in uh, on the figures and the architectural elements, but also the design uh, creates continuity. And um, for instance, in this picture, you can see there is at the bottom a cornice, with, uh, which is uh, has brackets and palmettes, uh, gilding, and then the lunettes also have gilded cornices. And then these, there are the full-size statues of deities and virtues that connect somehow with the, with the space, they, they share the space of the architecture, and also encrusted decoration that includes putti, masks, fantastic creatures, festoons, and strap work. And finally, there's also a painted background which looks gold in the lunettes and has also uh, this sort of floral and animal um, um, repertoire which we call grotesques because it uh, it comes from the so-called grotto of Nero in Rome and became very fashionable in the Renaissance. And then you have monochrome frescoes that I showed before. So there is a sense of horror vacui. The gaze follows the curving lines and is intoxic intoxicated by the lavishness of the whole. Um, elements are constantly varied. Only the line of Saint Mark and the doge's coat of arms are repeated twice each. Then the only other element that gives continuity is the architectural features that recur here and there, like the ovuli, which is this egg shapes sort of uh, small elements at the bottom of this image, uh, or the palmettes that you find uh, just between the brackets and um, volutes that connect the architectural frames. But then you have the statues that seem to walk out of the space between the lunettes as if they were part of the architecture. They relate with the golden background as emerging uh, from the surface. And you better see this from this picture probably, uh, where you see how the golden background really uh, it forms a, a backdrop to the physical presence of these of these figures. They it kind of emerge from the surface. And here also you have a nice detail, I think, uh, that gives you a sense of what I'm saying. 
Um, now then, I mentioned festoons. You see uh, some details here uh, and here. Festoons and scroll work and strap work that connect figures both within the lunettes, like here, for instance, where you have the monochrome frescoes at the center of the lunettes, and then this cornice, which is this frame, which is made of scroll work, uh, which imitates leather work. And then festoons, they all connect uh, every single... Um, I am beat of the of every single space uh, within the lunette and without, and then the mask, which can be of a lion or, or of a, a sort of a of a, a deformed face, like in here. So um, there is a um, there is a sense of you know continuity between these um, uh, various aspects or elements of the decoration. And finally, what I found very very striking, and I never noticed until. I climbed up the um, uh, scaffolding, which is now on this oversized scroll walk that connect the ceiling frames, which is borne by this winged figure, which is probably a figure of a victory, and um, which is filled with stones that mimic uh, natural formations, which I find absolutely astonishing. I've never seen anything like that before in Venice, I have to say. So where does this all this come from? Well, we have sources that mention that this is a um, Roman-like decoration, a la, a la, a la Roman, um, because, of course, there is this reference to ancient Roman types, and especially in the iconography. However, you can find something similar to this elsewhere, like in France, for instance, where in the Chateau of Fontainebleau, which was the royal residence, in the 15, between the 1530s and 1550s, um, a new kind of decoration that combined um, paintings and stuccos, creating a rhythmic sequence of varied forms, uh, was created for the first time by Italian artists. Uh, so you see here uh, um, a structural relationship between the figures the architectural elements and the paintings, which are in frescoes. And the unifying role is uh, entrusted of all this to the frames, which include scroll work and strap work, like you see here, for instance, in the at the bottom uh, uh, either side. And this is an invention that comes from Fontainebleau, this use of scroll work and stra strap work as the unifying element. There is no repetition, no um, no single element that can that is repeated twice. The only uh, continuity is given by the salamander on top of every fresco at the center. The salamander was the emblem of King Francis II, so it's a royal uh, motif. You see putti, you see festoons, and in in every single image, you see that the frames have a double function. They delimit the depictions in paintings and relief, but at the same time, they belong to the architectural ornament that orders the whole composition. Um, I have a few images here, for instance, on top here. Uh, you can see a scroll walk uh, framing encasing the salamander, putti everywhere and festoons, and also here, where the, there are these two scrolls, pairs of scrolls at either side of the fresco, which are quite, which is quite interesting. What is interesting also is that uh, you find this basically in our room. Uh, this huge scroll that I mentioned before may remind some of the scrolls that you um, can find in the um, uh, in the gallery of Francis the first in Fontainebleau. Um, you yeah, can also see the variety of, of putti with festoons, with, with garlands, with uh, fruits, and so forth. So how did this language came to Venice? Well, basically, this was this became very spread and uh, common, widespread and common in Europe, thanks to prints in the first instance. There was a royal print making workshop that in Font was based in Fontainebleau and also in Paris. And so these motifs became very common. But also think of the Venetians, they were among the most famous diplomats in Europe. So that certainly they knew what was going on at the, the, in the different courts of Europe. So they certainly knew of Fontainebleau. And what I find incredibly similar to our room is 
this one, the apartments of Madame de Tampes, um, which uh, has a, a level of incrustation of, of, of stucco and gilding, which reminds me really closely of our room. Now, I'm not contending that this is intentional, but certainly what this tells us is one important thing, that the language, the idiom, uh, of the of the of this room of the four doors is international and has ro royal origins and comes from a Romanized taste, a taste for uh, um, um, the Roman origins of this kind of decoration. Now, as I said before, unfortunately, the states of conservation of this uh, decoration is really poor. Dirt, as you can see on these two sculptures. Uh, missing elements mentioned before, for instance, the scale and sword of this figure, or uh, abrasions like on the right, or fell or falling of uh, material, and cracking uh, or um, um, crumbling, like in this case. But the frescoes are in no better state. Uh, you can see the cracking here in the in the central fresco, but also uh, abrasions, uh, which were kind of repaired since the 17th century up to the 19th century, which makes it very difficult to distinguish between the original painting and the repaintings. And probably this detail refers to Tintoretto's original painting. Uh, so one of the challenges for the restorers here is precisely to make choices and determine what is ancient, what is less ancient and probably 19th and even 20th century. Now, the main problem, of course, as many of you may know, is that fresco is not certainly um, welcome in Venice, which is, for, due to its humidity, uh, not really the ideal place for frescoes. Now, I want to go uh, to talk about frescoes in the remaining time, which is probably 15 uh, to 20 minutes. And... Um, uh, in the first instance, what are these frescoes about? So we, we we now talk about liberty and nobility, but starting with the central image, which is about the birth of Venice. The subjects were seemingly devised by a guy whose name is written here, Francesco Sansovino. He was a polymath. He was the son of the architect Jacopo Sansovino, who redesigned the major buildings in St. Mark's Square and is responsible for giving this Roman uh, shaped to the architectural idiom of St. Mark's Square. So Francesco Sansovino wrote a guidebook in, of Venice in 1581, where he describes these paintings. And this is a quotation, Venice is being sent by Jupiter to these waters for she was made by God's will so as to preserve, preserve the religion and liberty of Christians. Now, the painting clearly shows Jupiter showing Venice uh, pointing down to the waters of the lagoon, and the Olympian deities are uh, around them, uh, uh, above. Of course, this is about the exceptionality of the site, which is wondrous, but also uh, um, a form a, a sort of natural shield, shelter from external threats. So the waters, and uh, famously the Venetians, uh, boasted that they never needed to uh, build walls because they had the waters. So Venice is presented here as intact and unviolated over time due to this natural site, but also because it was uh, conceived in, Christ in God's uh, mind. So uh, this is one thing, this is about the predestination of Venice that the Venetian claimed, which I mentioned before, being part of the plan for human salvation. And this is connected to the good government of the Venetians. So uh, Venice was born Christians, unlike most of contemporary cities in Italy. And um, so this painting is very much about this. There is continuity with the theme of the Staccos, the Olympian deities, as a metaphor of God's favor. You see that Jupiter and Venice here are on the same path. They look like in symbiosis. And actually, uh, there is famously uh, this sort of purity of the state of uh, um, being intact and unviolated of the city of Venice was by the Venetian associated with the figure of Mary. So in a sense, these are Jupiter and Venice, but they may also be understood as Christ and Mary in some 
other ways. At the same time, this presence of Jupiter is something that you, that was already um, 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 had been already um, um, introduced in the Doge's Palace by Veronese more than 20 years earlier in uh, this painting, which is originally was in the room uh, just next to the uh, this one uh, in the Council of Ten, where Jupiter, of course, in this case, is a symbol of justice, using the thunderbolt to drive away the vices. So justice is very important, but the room of the four doors lays emphasis on liberty and religion, as you can see here from San Sabino's quotation. Um, so liberty and religion under the aegis of Christian faith. And basically the point is that Venice's good government, which warrants liberty to its subjects, is guaranteed by her respect for piety and devotion. But it is also the other way around because Venice is meant to protect religion because of her good government. There is a sort of mission that the Venetians lay claim to, uh, claiming for a role in history to protect Christendom. So Venice has justified hands. This is still a medieval idea of Christendom as a whole and as an interconnected Christian Republic. And this is what the Venetians here are claiming. And when I say the Venetians, I mean the nobleman, the ruling class, of course. So the origins of Venice in this painting are completely transfigured allegorically. There is no story, no foundational myth, unlike in Florence, for instance. In the same room as I showed before, you find this scene of the foundation of Florence, which is connected to the Roman foundation. So this is completely immersed in history, whereas in the case of Venice, historical reality is sacrificed for an ideological transfiguration. And Venice is... Um, Venice's assumed perfection as a state is made coincide with the exceptional environment and shape of the urban site. Now, the next painting, which is, uh, uh, there are two tondi next to the central image, and this one represents liberty. As Sansovino says, you see a woman smashing a yoke with other figures around bearing the, pe the peleus as a token of liberty. For being born free, she has kept safeguarding the time-honored and splendid liberty of Italy, and everybody flees to Venice as to a safe and free port to preserve their life and wealth. I think this is very straightforward. We have the Peleus here, these two hats. This is a conic brimless cap, which was a symbol of liberty in antiquity, and the yoke that is being broken. Now, this it, when we say subjugated in English, that comes precisely from the Latin term for yoke, yugum. Sub yugum means to be under a yoke, so subjugated. So smashing it means the original liberty of Venice, which is a typical theme of the Venetian historiography, eulogy and self-presentation. Venice was founded by free people. This is the claim. We escaped the barbarian, inv barbarian invasion, invasions. And this made of Venice made Venice superior to Rome because was born not only Christian, but also free and was never subjugated. So this buttresses the central allegory because it shows Venice as a safe shelter. Remember the, the first image of Venice being um, led to the waters that are safe and also uh, made makes of Venice the bulwark of liberty in Italy. And this is uh, in this sentence by Sansovino. This is a medieval theme of the defense of Italy against the invaders, foreign invaders. And in at the end of the 16th century, the situation was no better because most of the Italian peninsula was under Spanish and imperial control. The second tondo is about nobility. And here Sansovino says that this is Juno accompanied by various virtues denoting nobility because originally noble people gave birth to this abode and dominion and thereafter they have always kept their illustrious blood incorrupt. Well, the term for dominion here that is used is imperium, which doesn't mean empire, but it means a lot of things, including empire. Um, the uh, interesting thing is that uh, there was a long-standing controversy about the origins of the Venetians as known Romans. 
Some believe they were fishermen and therefore poor and lowly, but look at this quotation by San Savino. The first Venetians were neither poor nor lowly fishermen, but mighty people. So this is again about the nobility uh, um, of Venice since its origin. As you see Venice as a personification with a scepter in, in their hand on the left, before Juno, who is J Jupiter's wife. The peacock is her attribute, as much as the pomegranate that you see on the right. And then the thunderbolt, of course, is Jupiter's uh, attribute that we have already seen. I'm not entirely sure what the figure to the right, to the left, proper left of Juno is bearing, probably a basket of, with roses, but certainly the figure at the bottom, to the right, is bearing a falcon, which was a symbol of nobility and magnanimity because it doesn't eat rotten meat. So um, if on the one hand, Venice was conceived naturally by God, as we have seen in the central allegory, on the other hand, she was also born out of a deliberate act of noble people. This is what Santovino tells us. So nobility is a combination of moral nobleness and also noble blood, because Santovino talks about virtues and incorrupt blood. And this chimes in a debates on nobility in the 16th century because you know nobility was not just a state of you know moral character but it was also about bloodline and in a time when the monarchies are taking over and when the ruler needs to be you know the the, the dynasty of a ruler mean needs to be reinforced and strengthened bloodline become essential it becomes essential for the venetians as well but the venetian claimed that they did not come from the they didn't have feudal roots. They were not subdued to the imperial bonds the, the, of, of feudalism. And therefore, they, they combined this idea of nobility with liberty. These are closely intertwined. And this has to do, of course, with the state of Venice as a republic. So lib uh, freedom and, uh, so sorry, free and independent. But the important thing, again, about bloodline is what I said at the very beginning and what makes of these decorations, and this one in particular, something so important to maintain and preserve nowadays, because this is about continuity with the past. And that exactly is what defined, at that time, the identity of Venice according to these decorations. Um, concluding with the next images, the side tondos, um, uh, celebrates uh, on the one hand Venice uh, and with we, married with Neptune, and this is uh, as Sansovino says in memory of the donation of the dominion over the sea from Pope Alexander III. This happened in the 12th century when the Venetians defended the Pope, and the Doge in turn received. So the Venetians claims claimed. Um, Emblems of authority uh, that, that were then carried along uh, to accompany the doge during public processions became the insignia of power of authority of the doge, but also um, the jurisdiction over the Adriatic Sea. And the other one, which is uh, described here, it was about uh, the, um, again, the, um, the virginity of Venice, the purity of Venice, incorrupt, shielding herself from external assaults, leaning on the world on a world globe, and she's said to be the only one uh, uh, among all the nations to be to have remaining corrupt and intact from other barbaric and tyrannical tyrannical governments. This connects with the central allegory, the idea of incorrupt birth, the incorrupt birth of Venice, uh, but connects also with the other allegories of liberty and, nobi and nobility, because Venice's liberty is confirmed by her political stability and independence as the only left bulwark against tyranny, and as remaining corrupt like the noble blood of the Venetians. So as you can see, this is all about the uh, continuity over time. Now, unfortunately, uh, these allegories, as you can see, this has been heavily repainted since the 17th century. This is documented and probably also later. Uh, it won't be easy to really um, um, understand um, precisely uh, how it will appear after the restoration, but we have a lot of sources, as you can see, that may tell us what uh, this is about. Finally, there are minor uh, tondi, uh, which show uh, eight main cities from the Dominion. These are um, some of the most important 
towns in the Veneto region, but also regions like Friuli and Istria, and an ancient small town, which is Altino, which um, basically establishes a link with the ancient origins, Roman origins of Venice. So what is what do we take from all this? And um, this is how they appear today, the, the eight tondas, the eight ovals. Well, um, you have to think about this place, as I said before, as a place where a lot of people were uh, passing through. A lot of these people were uh, delegates, as I said before, from foreign countries, but also from subject ter territories. And they, from this room, entered other rooms. For instance, they entered the Collegio Room. The Collegio Room has one of the most astonishing and elaborate programs in the palace. One of those allegories talks about the strength of the rule. The term here is imperium, again, the rule or the government. This is the place where the rulers, and the doge included, encounter the subject. So these are messages that are relayed both to the subjects and to the rulers. What is shown here is Neptune to the right and um, Mars to the left. They indicate, symbolize the two, um, the dominion of Venice, the land dominions, and the, uh, and, which is Mars, and the sea dominions, which is Neptune. The same message you can find in the uh, um, giant's stairway in the courtyard, which is where the, which was, where the doge was crowned, but also where the doge pledged his total submission to his duties as a servant to the state. Uh, because he had the dignity of a monarch, but the duties of any other citizen. So that's what uh, that's was supposed to be about. And I should remind you that the winged lion is present in the room. So what is really novel about these cycles compared to the previous times is that they all lay stress on the subject as the crucial element that demonstrates the efficiency, efficiency of the Venetian government and the solidity of the Republic as a cohesive state. The Room of the Four Doors focuses on the origins of Venice framed within the formation of the territorial state. There is a, a Republican idea of liberty combined with an idea of the sovereignty of the state, what I called the imperium. And um, this is certainly, this reflects the times the Renaissance new emphasis on expansion, on dominion and control. It's a time of the nascent early empires like the Spanish empire over uh, beyond Europe in the Atlantic, but also the Portuguese empire. And then all the other ones, the French empire in the following century and so on. Uh, this idea is fused with the medieval concept of Christian Republic that I mentioned before but also with the 16th century ideology of the emperor as a soldier of Christ who defends Christendom. And the Venetians presented themselves as those who give liberty um, and they're noble fighters that protect their people from tyranny and from external threats. So Venice is presented as totally independent and indigenous, safeguarded by her patriciate. This is how the aristocracy in Venice called itself with a reference to how the Roman aristocracy called itself. The patriciate guarantees protection and freedom to the peoples. So Venice's political configuration is intertwined with her native origins, which are bound to an extraordinary uh, geographical and natural site, which is the lagoon, as well as a unique historical condition, which is what I mentioned before, escaping from the barbarian invasions, having Roman origins, but being born Christian. So a, a question here which remains open, and maybe the restoration will help us to better understand, is whether the cycle is a response to compensate for Venice's waning power within the European scenario at that time. There's certainly a new artistic form that promotes an image of Venice that relaunches the pretensions and ambitions of the ruling class as a group based on claims of time-honored prestige, continuity of institutions, and fulfillment of ideals of justice and equality, but is centered around the consensus, participation, and happiness of the subject peoples as required in the newly formed early modern states. Thank you very much.
just thought the person was not okay. Well, thank you, Giorgio, for this really, really fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, it feels like that I've learned so much in just 40 minutes. Incredible. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A section, uh, I would just want to remind everyone who is following us that we are currently working, as you can see in this picture on the slide, we're currently working on the uh, ceiling as well as on the doors. Uh, Say Venice want to extend its deepest gratitude to all the supporters and donors who have been helping us uh, making this possible. And I also want to point out that whoever wants to know more about um, funding opportunities, I will ask you to contact our uh, development team in New York and you can see um, the email addresses on the slide. Um, so let's move to the Q&A question. Um, there are a number of questions. I will start with one that addresses which uh, what I think was the most fascinating part of this talk. Uh, first of all, it was quite interesting to see how Venetian decided not to follow models from Florence, for example, that was very clear. Uh, what was very interesting, I think, to everyone was this connection uh, with Fontainebleau. And who do you think will be able to envision a design like that? And why? That's, that's just something interesting. Why would they choose to have a non-Venetian style, non-Venetian language, something, uh, an international language? I found that the description quite interesting. Who will be able to do something like that? Okay, um, this is a very good question, and actually, it I should I would say that it should be inflected in it's kind of a different way. Why did they do that in this particular room? Because, yeah, because then all the other rooms were made in a more Venetian way, uh, according to Venetian standards, with canvases, with gilded frames in wood. Uh, why was this different? Um, I think we should, and they, they were made at the same time as the other ones. So the, there was a specific, there, there was an intention deliberate to make this, to, to set this apart, to make it different. And I wonder if that has to do with the fact that everybody could walk through this room, whereas this can, can't be said for the other adjacent rooms, of course. If I had to go to the Council of Town room for a, a hearing, I would go straight to, as a citizen, I would go straight to that room uh, rather than to another one. So um, it has perhaps one possibility is that they thought that something which is so imposing because of the presence of these cultures and probably easy to grasp with these very simplified allegories worked very well for everybody. Also frescoes basically can be better seen than canvases from below. Mm. Um, and maybe the immediacy of this, at least in my opinion, because you don't have the, the sheen or reflection that you may have with a canvas because you don't have the varnish. And, and it might be that this is one, you know, there are practical reasons. On the other hand, of course, there is possibly the idea of creating something which is a stately room in a more international way, kind of stepping away a bit from the Venetian typical patterns and everybody would expect from this kind of decoration. I'm just trying to figure out, but um, this is certainly something art historians have never reflected on. And I suppose... One of the reasons, and in the end, I didn't mention that, although I wanted to, is that I think that the poor state of conservation of this room is a factor in the fact that it's completely unstudied and there is no single essay on this room um, in its own right. There are uh, bits of larger studies that talk about only the frescoes, basically, and mention perhaps in passing the stuccos. Okay, thank you about this. Uh, there are a number of questions, uh, more technical in a way. Uh, I don't know if there is more to know about Bombarda 
is workshop, uh, whether they created their sculptures within a workshop and then wrote there in the room, or if you if we know more about it, as you just said, there is really no literature uh, addressing this room. So it is something up to discussion, I, I, I assume. Yeah, we know the name of Lombarda because uh, this is what Santovino says. He also mentions Andrea Palladio as the author of the, the layout. Uh, I'm not sure how often this is mentioned in Palladio's literature. We know that Palladio was employed in the Lugis Palace in, on several occasions during these restoration campaigns after the fire, 1574, 1578, sorry, two fires. He was employed with the task of redesigning the rooms, but not, I don't know whether it's been studied in this case. Um, Bombarda, I don't know personally very much. I'm a specialist in painting. I mm. never really studied him. There is a literature on Bombarda, but I'm not sure this is from a Venetian point of view. So I, I would, I think there is a, a gap in the literature here, supposedly. And then a final question, I would say, um, in connection to conservation treatment, you mentioned how, and this is something that we discussed while visiting the uh, the work site, you mentioned how the Venetians, actually the, uh, the rulers, decided to uh, restore this room as well as the old palace from the very beginning. Uh, you mentioned before the, the first conservation treatment starting in the 17th century, if I remember correctly. There was a purpose there, which is quite interesting to discuss, I think where is no more no longer related to authorship but more to the message what, what is it yeah there is um there is a documentation uh which is um also quite interesting uh beginning with the 17th century up to the end of the of the republic at the end of the 18th century about repainting in the doge's palace uh a lot of the, the rooms well even the canvases were damaged by rain and uh, especially those that are hung nearer the ceiling. And we know that there's a, a constant work of conservation to preserve the, uh, the, the images. So I suppose surely the Venetians have consciousness, so we're aware of the, the artistic value and the names attached to the paintings, uh, in particular, like Tintoretto or Veronese and so on, was, bit, was very important to them. What mattered most was the message, I'm sure about it. So it's it's a way of preserving the message in terms of co the co same continuity I mentioned before. So it's very important for them to continue propagate the, um, the message and hand it, it down to the next generations. And this is precisely, I suppose, the real value of these messages. And in, uh, if I had to be asked about what to do with, with, with these images, I would say, let's try to preserve the, the message as much as possible, even if it's not an original painting, but it's an integration because it's very likely to just feel uh, um, a gap, a, a, a fall, an abrasion with something that was there before and trying to maintain the message there as it should be. And this is the other thing about the Doge's Palace. I'm not entirely sure that the visitors nowadays really get entirely the message, the significance of the palace. And this is due probably to strategies and choices that have been made over the years um, uh, in terms of how to uh, tolerate the number of visitors in the palace. It's not easy to reach out to them and convey these meanings, of course. But at least one thing is important, is that the Venetians were absolutely, and, and uh, we have evidence of this everywhere, they were absolutely uh, clear about the, the significance of the, pal the, pal the palazzo. It was the living memory. It was the ring that kept the chain of the political stability of Venice intact. 
So I suppose this works also in terms of restoration, restoration mm -hmm. over the over the centuries that what they did. Okay, this is very interesting. <laughs> and let's see. Okay, so Sarah McCam is asking if this connection with Fontainebleau could be related to the visit of King Henry in 1574, if that can be. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. This is uh, absolutely, yeah, this is a very good question. I think, yes, I think there is, but the problem is linked with the dates of the room which are, we, we, we're not sure when exactly it was painted. Sorry, uh, and this sorry. answer to another question that was made, so perfect for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw the question. Yeah. So I, I was also at the same time responding to that question. We don't know exactly when it was concluded, completed. The fire is 1574, just a few weeks uh, before um, um, Harry III, uh, the 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 new king of France basically escaped Holland, where he was the king, elected king, to go to France to be coronated, to be crowned, and uh, and famously he stops in Venice eleven for eleven days and he is celebrated as in the most magnificent way. In my studies and in my book, this event plays a crucial role because alongside with another event, which is the famous victory over the Ottomans in 1571 at Lepanto, these two events become the, um, the, the main, the, the, they become the, the main points of reference and the underpinnings for the rhetoric, the visual rhetoric created by the Venetian between the 1570s and 1590s until the end of, which is exactly when, when all of these new cycles are completed, devised and completed after the fires so I think Fontainebleau could be there because of this importance played by Henry III. Also, I should add that one of the paintings in the room on the walls, which are added later, probably in the 1590s, we're not sure, depicts the arrival of Henry III of France at the Lido, on the Lido uh, with the triumphal arch, which was designed by Palladio. And also I should add... <clears throat> that when I show the giant's stairway, uh, one interesting feature that is usually overlooked by both the visitors, because they, they, they don't pass there, and art historians, quite interestingly, is that the, at the very top of the flight on the wall, there is um, a plaque that, re that commemorates that arrival of Henry III in Venice, 1574. How come? What is the reason for that? I have a precise idea about that. And I think it's because at that time, aside from the political counterbalance that the French king represented against Spain and the empire, the Habsburgs, it also was, it embodied the idea of a monarch that was saluted, was hailed as a, as a peacemaker within Christendom at a time of world religions, from a Catholic point of view, which is Venice's point of view, and also the French kings, traditionally, they had this sort of, this, they had this alternative role to the emperor as the soldier of Christ that protects Christendom. And I think it's the idea of regality and sovereignty that the French king embodies that makes him so important. So it might be, that there is a link with Fontainebleau, and it might be that this comes through this kind of shift in, in, in approach. But this is a bit conjectural for now, though absolutely it could be possible. Okay, thank you. I think this question, this last question was very important to expand a little bit more about your talk. So thank you, Sarah personally for for it i will say since there are no long no more questions that we can move on now uh first of all thank you giorgio bravo this was very very terrific presentation um and thank you again of course to everyone who has remained i see a lot of people still remain until the end of this lecture again a very successful one um i want to remind everyone that a video 
um, uh, uh, sorry, video recording of this talk was will be available soon as we, on Seveni's YouTube channel as well as on our website. And I will also remind you that on April 22, on Monday, 2024, uh, in a 10 days mostly. Um, here at the Rosen Library and Study Center, there will be um, a roundtable uh, held by uh, conservator Enrica Colombini and myself, uh, focusing on a very fascinating altarpiece. It's a folding altarpiece from the Malamocco Church in the um, island of Lido. It's a project by Sevenis, and we will discuss about the conservation treatment, but also about the functioning and the mechanical functioning of this very, very interesting object. Uh, the uh, talk will be in Italian. Uh, there are two options to follow it. Uh, virtually through uh, Zoom as well as in person. And for those who want to come here in person, they need to register. You will receive all the information on the uh, online. So for today is all. Goodbye, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you again. Bye.